There we go. So, Neo, the word is yours, please. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you in his absence to Igor for kindly inviting us to, to present uh, this work. Um, I'll start with a series of disclaimers about this uh, exercise in terms of what it actually is, um, because th this is exclusively based, obviously, on desk research. So um, we've had various people follow up uh, with me to try and share more information about things that we might have missed and so on. And obviously, uh, there's limitations in terms of language. So we've focused, um, because of our linguistic limitations, on uh, predominantly resources that are in English. Um, and I'm aware of a lot of other activities that are, are taking place elsewhere, although we, we did try through some of what we got to, to, to source some of this information as well. Um, and in, in some places, a little bit of what we put out there was, was a bit contentious um, for reasons that I'll explain shortly. But I'm, hope, I'm hopeful that if it was contentious, it was in a constructive way in, in terms of what we hope this might uh, precipitate um, over time. So also just then in, in terms of where a lot of our focus has been recently, uh, we I've been in sort of, everyone seems insistent on making up for three years of travel lockdown. And so I've already done nine trips this year so far um, to different parts of the world to, to begin various uh, processes of engagement. And we have now, um, quite close working partnerships with at least four national governments in Botswana, in, um, in uh, Tanzania, in Zanzibar, and in actually a provincial government here in South Africa, in my home province of Gauteng, uh, where we're really focused on trying to give life to the OER recommendation um, beyond policy proclamations. Uh, but what we wanted to do in this particular piece of research were, was to explore national policy commitments and what we can see as an evidence base of what impact those policy proclamations have had on practices on the ground. Um, and there were various reasons why this is important, but obviously one of the critical ones is, is to see uh, from the perspective of the UNESCO OER recommendations implementation, uh, what role uh, national policies can play in supporting the implementation of more effective OER practices. Um, so I, I think people are reasonably familiar from, from things that have happened in the past and research that's been done, that there's lots of countries that have been working on national policies of, of various descriptions. And again, you know, please, please be clear, I'm not talking about institutional policies here. I'm also not talking about state level policies uh, or provincial policies. We are talking, we were looking quite explicitly at, at national policy commitments. Um, and there is a kind of conventional wisdom that effective educational policies can be transformative um, and that, that policy then becomes a key indicator of OER practice. But the, the kind of rational logic is that when an OER policy is well designed and implemented, it could, drive, it could act as a driving force for creating and sustaining OER ecosystems. Um, and, and we're aware of a lot of work being done at the national level on, on policy development. But you know, those of us who've been around the block a few times are quite suspicious about uh, statements about whether OER policies actually do act as a driving force um, for, for creating real change on the ground. So we wanted to try and see if there was any way to build an evidence base to make the case that, that OER policies were having that effect. And if they were, whether standalone OER policies that were separate from other policy instruments were more effective or less effective than uh, policy commitments that were integrated into mainstream strategies or, or, or plans. Um, my hypothesis would have been that, an, that OER policy commitments that are integrated into mainstream policies ought to be more effective because they should be aligned um, with with what the bigger policy priorities of the country are. So what we, we managed to find um, was 27 examples of standalone national OER policies um, and 16 national policies that contained OER commitments. 
I, I hope that distinction is clear for people in terms of, of, of how I'm differentiating them. Um, and then unfortunately what we discovered is that it became very difficult for us to be able to assess which of those two particular types of policy uh, were showing greater effectiveness in terms of what OER practices were then happening at the national level as a consequence of those OER policies. Because we, we sort of set up a, a criteria, I'm just summarizing it here, the more, more details contained in the report. So we needed number one evidence that the policy had actually been approved by the government. And that may sound like uh, a, an odd thing to say, but for example, in Mauritius, there's been an OER policy for I think two years, and it was only actually approved last month. So that policy, which a lot, you know, Sanjaya from Commonwealth of Learning wrote to me as soon as this report came out and said, you know, but you, you've missed Mauritius, for example. I said, well, no, we haven't missed it. The problem is it wasn't an approved policy at the time at which we did this research. So we needed to have clear evidence that the, that the policy had actually been approved by government, which meant that, it, it, you know, we, there, there, there are things we we're looking for there. Then we needed availability of some baseline documentation of what OER activities were already underway in the country before the policy came into effect, if we could get that, uh, because obviously we, what we wanted to see is were there things happening, then the policy is approved, and is there a change in what's happening, or is it staying the same? So, so we were looking for that, but obviously if we didn't find the baseline, that wouldn't have been a problem. And then again, looking for evidence of meaningful OER practices that had been implemented since the policy was approved. And again, we are focused here on national level activities. So things that were being implemented by ministries of education and not necessarily by institutions, although we looked at that level as well. And, and so unfortunately, um, what we discovered at least online is that in places where policies did exist and had been approved, which was a much smaller subset of the total number of uh, things that we found, um, we, we found it very difficult to actually find any concrete evidence um, of OER practices that were being implemented out of that policy approval. And I, I was at arm's length from this research, so I did not influence it in any way, um, because if I had, this is exactly what I would have said would have, we, were, we were going to find. Uh, so I was very careful to stay completely separate from this and the researcher who helped me with this is living in Canada, so I couldn't even phone her up easily and uh, and, and persuade her about any kinds of things. She, she went out, did the research herself, we agreed on the methodology, and, and this is what she managed to find. Now, again, as a disclaimer, I will not claim at all that this is representative of the global reality. It, it's representative of what we managed to find online. Uh, and there's, there's always limitations associated with that. Um, so in, in terms of sort of critical things that, that we then documented in the, in the report, um, we found very limited evidence of policy implementation that was taking place in line with the policy provisions of either standalone OER policies or other policies that contained OER commitments. Um, so there's been a plethora of activity at the national level uh, particularly in the developing world where the IGOs, particularly UNESCO and Commonwealth of Learning are, have been key players here, have gone around the world supporting governments to create OER policies. We're finding it very difficult to see any evidence that that is leading to any real serious changes in uh, practice. Um, so then because of that, it then became impossible for us to answer our core question, which was, are standalone OER policies more effective than OER, than OER policy commitments that are integrated into existing instruments? Uh, again, my hypothesis would have been that integrated policy commitments are more are likely to be more impactful than standalone OER policies because my experience of standalone policies, whether it's in e-learning or OER, is that they're easy to write and approve, and then people also easy to ignore. Uh, so you can come back in five or 10 years time and find that nothing's happened. But when it's integrated into a mainstream national strategy, that's much harder um, to, to, uh, to ignore. So obviously we did find, you know, I don't want to, in saying what I'm saying here, I'm not trying to say that we didn't find any information or any evidence of policies leading on to practice. 
just not enough to be able to draw any conclusions about what is or isn't more effective. Um, so, so you'll see there, there were too few policies that fitted our criteria for us to be able to draw meaningful, meaningful comparison. There's quite a lot of conflicting information online, and, and we've tried to document some of that. We can share more information. Uh, if you like, I, I do think, you know, going back to some of what we were talking about, about the role of the network of open orgs, these might be some things we could think about, about how to plug some of these information gaps. And then for me, what's most important is that there's very limited information that reports on practices that have emerged as a direct result of policy commitments. Um, and, and, and I think that this is really where we ought to be focusing our attention. Uh, and, and I'll come back to that as, as I think about the way forward. Um, and then, as I said, it also becomes very difficult then to distinguish between OER activities that have been, uh, that have taken place as a direct result of a national policy being approved and those activities that were happening anyway and that are independent of the policy's influence. Obviously, that's much harder uh, to be able to prove one way or the other, of course. So as we look at this, um, what we kind of can only come to conclusions at at this stage is that there's no clear evidence that an OER policy is a precondition for meaningful OER practices, which I think we would all have uh, suspected anyway. Um, but it, it does seem to be a potential enabler still in creating a coordinated national effort geared towards OER implementation. So again, when you go into the detail in the report, I'm just summarizing here, we, we're not, I'm not presenting all this information as if it's doom and gloom. Uh, all I'm trying to, to, to illustrate is that there are big data gaps and evidence gaps in terms of the connection between these things, which I think we ought to be thinking about um, as a network and, and as individual organizations. So then because national strategies, which are not the same as policy, play a role in implementation, we did probe the relationship between OER policy provisions and national strategies or plans to ascertain whether the, uh, the provisions in the policy, the, in the strategies are aligned with government's broader educational priorities, particularly in the developing world, is a kind of tendency to have policy documents and then to consolidate everything into a five-year strategy. Um, and, and what you often see is that the five-year strategy is as notable for, for many of the things it leaves out that are policy commitments as it is for the things that it contains. So these you know, policies are long wish lists and then the national strategy consolidates uh, a, a few of the key policy priorities. A, at that point, again, you know, commitments to OER tend to be very thin on the ground. Um, there are some examples, but but often not many. Um, so, so in general, we, we found that policies that contain OER commitments, whether they're standalone or otherwise, are not necessarily aligning with coordinated national uh, efforts in other government documents, these kinds of five-year plans and, and other kinds of things. And so, again, there's a, I think there, there, there's a lesson there about actually the importance of making sure that the policy development is very closely aligned with those national strategic planning processes, um, because that's really, particularly in the developing world, that tends to be where the budgetary allocations are, are focused. And so if, if things are left out of that, you can have all the policy commitments you like in the world, but they don't tend to make much difference. Um, and so obviously the ideal scenario would be that OER policy provisions should align with government strategic priorities. And these should ideally be consistently expressed in the government's overall vision for the education system and in the documents that it releases and implements. So what we thought that this highlighted um, was the, the firstly a need to problematize the idea of education policy as it relates to the OER movement and interrogate why OER policies are developed, what their function is and how they're implemented. Uh, if you look, for example, at UNESCO's um, policy guideline, uh, guide toolkit, and, and there's another similar one that's come out around um, uh, I think educational technology policies. Uh, I very often get the impression that these are written by people who actually haven't got any experience of policy implementation in government. Uh, and so they're these very long and elaborate and complex documents th that operate certainly not in any real world that I'm familiar with in my work with governments. 
Um, and, and so I think those, I think those are quite problematic. Uh, and I, th I think we, we should be having a longer conversation within the OER movement about what we think the purpose of policy is and what that would mean for what policies ought to look like if we want, and again, I'm talking at the national level, of course, uh, if we want them to support the, the, the effective propagation of uh, OER practices. So, so, I, I do, so, so what we're trying to do is to emphasize the importance of that debate taking place. Um, so as part of that, it's really important to think about misalignments between policy provisions and what it's realistic to implement. Um, that, that's why I'm particularly nervous about standalone policies because they tend to be very idealistic in terms of what they promise. Uh, and then that's why they get so easily ignored. Obviously important is allocating resources for policy review processes to determine the validity, relevance, and progress in achieving policy outcomes. Many of the policies I look at don't even have policy outcomes defined. So uh, it, it, we, we wouldn't necessarily even be able to, to review the success of implementation of the policy because the, the policy proclamations and statements are, are too high level and abstract. And then we, obviously, we, we also need to be researching and reflecting on policy wins and shortcomings. So, so we hope that, that what the report we've put together will do is, is pose a series of questions that together we can hopefully start to find the answers to. Um, but what we wanted to do is to problematize the idea that just going around generating OER policies in, is, is in some form indicative of success. Uh, we don't think that there's any evidence to sustain that observation. So if you're interested in seeing the full report, uh, there's the, the QR code for it. Um, so in, interestingly, in, in the government engagements that we're working on at the moment, I think you know, what's becoming increasingly clear is that there are really very meaningful and concrete ways in which OER and OERs and open licensing can play a very meaningful role in supporting uh, implementation of government policies. So in all in the three countries that I've mentioned that, that I've been visiting in the last month or so, uh, or sorry, two months, which is Botswana, Tanzania, and Zanzibar, all three of them have a very clear and present national need for implementation of activities that are going to have to draw very heavily on OERs. Um, and obviously, fortunately, I happen to be at the table, so we can make that happen quite easily. Um, but I think that what that highlights is, is the OER experts really have to embed themselves deeply in the work of governments if they want uh, what's then developed as OER policies uh, and, and policy commitments to be able to align with those needs and to start to meet those needs. So, so that would be the first key observation. The second key observation, and, and actually this is something we're starting to do at an institutional level with the Botswana Open University and the University of Namibia, is that very often these OER policies, so these are institutional policies, but the same principle would apply at the national level. We develop the policy, but we have no metrics for being able to measure the extent to which there's any implementation taking place um, one year to the next. So we're actually working with both of those institutions to help them put a simple monitoring metric in place to distill from the policy, you know, these are three key metrics that you should be ideally seeking to shift the needle on. And let's look each year and see whether or not you're making progress. I don't know whether it will be three or five. I still need to start working on those. And I think definitely at the national policy level, if we could radically simplify the policy commitments and focus on a few key things where successful implementation can actually be tracked, as part of a national strategy implementation, we'd have much more success than creating long, elaborate, uh, abstract statements of policy commitment to a whole bunch of different things that people just ignore. You know, so, so the grandstanding statements about the importance of openness and about you know the importance of government funding being used for uh, being linked with open licensing, you know, all that stuff is nice. But to operationalize it is, is very complicated. So, so I, what we're finding in the, in the case of these uh, countries is that what's really simple is they're rolling out a lot of ICT arc, uh, infrastructure into schools. There is a clear and present need for content in specific priority areas. 
we can package OERs to meet that content need in the very short term with very quick turnaround. We've already started doing that in Zanzibar and we can have that out and operationalized in schools in a few months. And if we can show that and we can build on that, that's much more effective uh, policy commitment that can be tracked over time than having a 15 page statement about the importance of OER. Um, so th those are just sort of, this is all just a work in progress. Um, and, and I think what I'd be interested in, in, in us maybe continuing as a conversation, if people are interested, would be what are the ways in which we can start to build this evidence base uh, more systematically and more coherently around policies that do get approved? Because policies are being approved. And, and at this point, we could move away, of course, from the national policy focus. We did that because that's the focus of our, uh, our work and our grant funding. But I think the same principles would apply at an institutional level, as, as I explained with Botswana Open University, um, is if we, if we develop policies, uh, can we build an evidence base that's tracking whether or not they actually have any impact? Uh, and, and again, the ob objective of this is not to either uh, affirm or reject policy instruments as a vehicle for change. It's to work out how to use them most effectively. Um, and, and I think the reality is, from what we've seen anyway, the evidence base is just way too thin to be able to make any strong statements one way or the other. Uh, and I think if we can work together to build that evidence base um, and, and, and to give guidance and advice about how that evidence base can be constructed and maintained in a manageable way over time, I feel like that would be a very significant uh, contribution. Um, I, I mean, I have another whole meta level of observation about this, which is whether then that all leads to actual meaningful educational transformation, which some of you who've had the misfortune of having to talk to me in more detail will know is a, a topic that's very dear to my heart and becoming uh, increasingly dear to my heart the more I go back out into the world and just see what a mess education systems really are again in practice. Um, but but I think that if we if we create a base where we we build where we, if we can create a methodology where we can build that evidence base, it's then I think quite easy to start expanding it to say not not only is are these OER policies actually leading to effective implementation, but then is the effective implementation leading to transformation of the kind that we would consider to be uh, useful in the modern world? But that would be a sort of second step once we had the evidence base in place. So sorry, I've, I've not had to present this before. Um, so, uh, and it, it all happened very much at the last minute. I think someone else pulled out, but I was really, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to start sharing our ideas. Uh, I hope you'll excuse me for the, um, the somewhat uh, obscure way in which I'm presenting everything, but uh, the, the, that's some of our thoughts up to now. Thanks, Neil. Sobering. Well, I don't think we can, we can't hear you. You're on mute. Sorry, I think I was, I was muted all the way along. Oh, wonderful. Anyway, I was congratulating you and saying there was nothing obscure about our presentation and that I, I have many comments to make, but I'll, I'll, I'll pass the word to Jen first and I'll, I'll raise mine in, when the time comes, please. Thank you, Neil. Fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I let me lower my hand. Um, I really appreciated that and look forward to reading the the full report. A part of me, part of me was reacting when you um, when you were presenting the findings because I think that there's still um, maybe there's still a valuable role that some of these more abstract policy instruments can play for people on the ground who need the top cover to do the work that they're already doing. So maybe the the question isn't about the direct impact that we see the policies affecting an open education, but the the way that people like us or people at um, different institutions managing 
some of the open education change that ideally we want to see. Um, seeing if, if this policy or different localized policies are the tools that they need to help give them the, the kind of go ahead that sometimes holds them back. So it might not be something that yields a very clear yes, no, this policy was effective, it wasn't, it immediately had impact or it didn't. Maybe it's a little um, more convoluted, but still really valuable. I think that'd be even more true with localized policies. Just want to put it out there. Thank you. Maybe I can go next, make a comment. Uh, so, so, you know, so just one thing, this, the scope of your research was Africa, right? You didn't go beyond Africa, am I right? Because you don't mention that, or am I wrong? Um, no, you're wrong. Um, wrong. I, I, mean, okay. I, I would I would say we we're, we're certainly skewed towards the developing world, just okay. because that's kind of what we know. Uh, and as I said, we, we're linguistically challenged, so that limited our ability to to locate uh, policies. And you know, I think particularly the, the area that I'm most aware of, where I think there is likely to be action, is is in South America, where I know that is. There's a lot of action, but even there, you know, if you look at Brazil, there's a lot of things happening. There's a lot of state commitments, but but at the national level, again, the policy provisions are limited. And I mean, even a lot of the excellent work that's being done in Brazil, obviously, the policy commitments are somewhat tenuous and and, and obviously influenced by political winds. So you know, so so we we tried our best, but but it, we did not limit ourselves to Africa. Okay, fantastic. It's great to hear that. I'm going to read your report because I've just uh, um, opened it in my phone. So because why am I saying that you're talking about many things that you're talking about resonates with previous studies that I've uh, managed to participate in and one of them was called um, open edu policies run by the European Commission uh, within the framework of the European Union. Um, we published that study in 2017, I think I put a link to it, and we were exactly doing a similar type of work. We were conducting um, research on national policy, so speaking to ministries of education of the EU member states, at the time 28, because the UK was still a, an EU member state. Now we are 27. And, but then we went a little bit beyond OER and we were talking about open education more in, in, more, in a global perspective, more in terms of open education practices. So our, our criteria for um, understanding what would be located as a policy in open education was done against the open edu framework, the European framework for open education. I think Eba re remembers that. That was then quite published about six years ago. And we're even talking about maybe it's time to, to do that research again to see how much we have advanced from, from 2007 to 16 when we started, no? But it's interesting to, to, to think that if we are aiming to start building an evidence-based kind of approach, um, we could, we do have then some parts of the world covered because I have a recent research that I carried out beyond Africa. So thanks for clarifying that. We have previous work done, the one I'm mentioning back in 2017, that's perhaps time to, to do some updating. But there are some convergences in our, in our findings, you know, even many years later, which is interesting. When you say that policies are tend not to be interconnected, that's something we found as well uh, in that report uh, for Europe. Um, the importance of getting more involvement of policymakers, you no, know, in terms of uh, understanding um, about OER and open education, um, and um, and the strategic planning processes. What we realize is that sometimes policies, OER policies, were integrated into national policies for digital education, for example, and sometimes they were completely separate. And 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 and, and so and then we do discuss case studies. So I think it's going to be interesting to to, to use uh, this new source of information that you are presenting more up to date, but also looking into what had been done in Europe before. For, for us to start building this, this evidence-based um, database that you're saying, because definitely this is, in my opinion, is an important uh, matter for, for more research and, and more action. And it could be one, one way for us to, something else for us to look at in this, 
in this joint venture of the network of open orgs. So, so just very quickly, I was what I just did is I popped this on the screen so that you could just quickly get a sense as to you, you'll see from the range of countries that we've looked at that it's it's pretty diverse. Again, you know, I, I claim nothing about the comprehensive nature of this. So if people told us there were gaps in this, I would accept that gladly. You know, we just put this out as a first cut at trying to pull this all together. Again, the important thing to note here is just that. That the existence of a policy that's been approved is not in itself sufficient for, 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 for the, a country's work to be included in this. We, we need to then be able to see if, if there's any evidence of actual implementation after the policy has been approved. And that's the area where we particularly struggle. So, so coming up with examples of, um, of, of policies that have been developed and approved and proclamations and things that have, that's a walk in the park. I mean, we were able to do that from a long time ago, uh, demonstrating that that's had any effect in terms of actual practice is the hard part. Um, and, and that's where I think it's going to be interesting also to see what comes out of uh, UNESCO's data set in terms of people reporting on the OER recommendation implementation. Uh, and so in many respects, this, you know, I've shared this obviously with Zenep as well. This is a kind of precursor methodologically to then being able, hopefully, to be able to do a much more systematic analysis of the responses of, I think, 75 or 76 countries have responded now. Um, but again, you, you know, we have to be very careful here because if, if the evidence is that we ran capacity building workshops on OER, like I'm not putting that down as evidence of effectiveness of implementation. That just means you ran some workshops. Uh, that's not leading to any anything any improvement in in educational outcomes for anyone of consequence. I, I mean, we'd recorded, of course, but you know it, that's not for me in anything substantive. Uh, and and so 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 we want, I think, over time through this discussion, to be able to think about what kinds of evidence of impact we're looking for, how we would measure it. Uh, and and what you know what what would be in and what would be out and obviously that's a debate. I I don't have any answers to that question. What we're trying to do is to start the debate through this report, um, not try and tell you that we know the answers. Uh, although those of you who listen to me now, I always think I have an answer to everything, but I change my mind every five minutes as well. So I think that's fair enough. Um, and yeah, but but you know, so we have no idea what would work successfully. But I do think as as these things build momentum. It's very, very important that we do have evidence of, of effectiveness because my counterpoint to your observation, Jen, and I, Jen, I completely agree with you about localized policy instruments. Um, what I would say though, is that there's a kind of risk of, of these large abstract policy proclamations because they also set the culture around a concept. Uh, and so I think that badly designed e-learning policies from 15, 20 years ago, we're still living with the consequences of those now in terms of the limited transformational impact that, that educational technologies had relative to what we hoped it would have. Because what those policies enabled is for business as usual to continue under the guise of transformation. And so I do think there's a risk. And you know, when a thing's been out there and it's been accepted for a long time, that there's all these big commitments and no one actually takes them seriously, then I think getting the policy commitment running from there becomes very difficult. So, sorry, Julian, um, I'll, I'll shut up now so that you can make more useful inputs than mine. But Thank you're, you. You're I, 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 Eba, you had your hands up or did they? Sorry. No? Uh, sorry, just first of all, thank you, Neil. I will definitely read uh, the entire report. Uh, it just reminded me when you were talking about standalone policies versus, you know, if they're integrated into something larger. In the meeting with uh, with the different members of the education coalition last week, they're talking about you know what different projects will we partner on uh, globally on digitalization specifically, and it made me question how are we taking into account the larger policies, the policies that aren't directly saying we are bringing technology into uh, a school, we are solving a certain issue with technology, for instance. And so we're bringing in partners as a government or a national, whatever. At what point is the 
uh, for instance, open science and open OER recommendation taken into account. And somehow it, it, it made me ask then, how are we making sure that when governments are approving projects or starting initiatives, it's integrated in that, taking into account the other policies. Uh, it's more of uh, an add-on, I guess, or a reflection to what you said. I think it makes a lot of sense to, to see how, what could be then, what are the national, international policies, but how are they actually integrated into all the ministries or all uh, application of education? So, yeah. I also wondered if there's a difference if maybe you saw a difference when it comes to impact on curation versus creation of open education o OERs. Somehow it, might, it seems easier to push policies and have impact on creation rather than actually use in schools, for instance. Um, I mean, there's lots of complex things that, that that you're talking about in there. I mean, all of them are very valid. I won't try and respond to everything. What I was just thinking about is the coincidence of, of me sitting in some meetings in Dar es Salaam last week, uh, where I discovered really to my absolute horror that the government has distributed 200,000 uh, tablets to every single teacher in the country um, with no accompanying strategy around what the teachers will actually do with that. Uh, with those devices. Uh, and this is unfortunately more typical than you'd like to hope. Um, and, and, and likewise, just fortunately gotten there early on this one, is a plan to roll out computer laboratories to 1500 secondary schools, likewise with no content strategy in place. Uh, and, and I think that <laughs> people who live in the rarefied world that unfortunately I don't get to live in, don't realize that that's actually how the real world functions most of the time. It's just complete chaos and ineptitude. And there's a certain degree of coincidence about just having to be in the right place at the right time to be able to shift that discussion. Because as soon as I say, well, you know, let's start assembling packages of, so they're more of a curation than creation. Because again, historically, everyone thinks, well, if we want content, we must create it. And that's certainly very much the case in the Tanzanian Institute of Education or in the National Curriculum Department of the Ministry of Education in Botswana. But now they've got these problems that they put all this technology out there and they can't justify its use. So we're fortunately happen to be there. So well, let's start assembling packages of resources based on critical topics in areas of need and get them out into these labs so that they can be used. And then everyone says, well, that's amazing. Let's do that. Now, what we're trying to do is to work out how you can then create policy um, commitments that actually force the agencies who are accountable for these things to actually then sustain the work after the initial rollout is completed so that it gets integrated into the agency's job descriptions, into the budgets, into the way in which they work. That's for me the point at which policy has become meaningful. Uh, and there's no substitute for that hard slog work. And, and I do think that part of the problem is that the OER community has created this false notion in many people's minds that you just go around, you know, and, and we, we love our colleagues from the Commonwealth of Learning and from UNESCO, but they go around the world, spend three days in a workshop with the government and create a policy and then think that that's the work done, uh, you know, and it's preposterous. So, so, so one has to be committed to then doing that hard work and, and working out how those agencies can support that. I, I will say that my emphasis is very squarely on saying you cannot carry on creating your own content. You do not have the capability or the resources to do that. So we need to develop a completely different set of capacities in those organizations. That's about project management. That's about quality assurance criteria and their application. That's about um, curation of content repositories and learning management systems, a whole skill set that isn't even properly defined, let alone accessible in those agencies. And that's, I think, where the exciting part of all of this is, is, is leading us, is that it is, I think, giving us guidance as to what kinds of things we can do that will have an impact. Sorry, again, too much. Thank you. Eba, yes. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Neil. It was really interesting to, to listen to this. I mean, it was, uh, uh, I will not, uh, I just have a reflection how important this is, what you just were saying. I mean, it is good to have, we all know that policies are, important and very good uh, and that is and it's not not enough to just have capacity building for teachers etc but 
the, the real interesting thing in my reflection, which you also pointed out, is how can this really be those policies, what kind of impact does it they really have and how can we monitor and evaluate that? I mean, there are it's like some kind of timeline you can't do it immediately. You have to have some kind of time in between. But it, this is really of interest because then we can really say that it make a difference with openness and with OER. And uh, as you were saying now, the last uh, sent uh, uh, sentence is about how it really have an impact on infrastructure, in um, resources, in fundings, in allocation of everything. I mean, that is really the point. So, so how can we how can we go further on with that uh, message which you, you just gave us? <laughs> That's the fun next part of the conversation here, but yeah. So, yeah. For me, of course, I think. I mean, if you really look at the recommendation, I mean, uh, it is covered in those five areas. Uh, if you put it there, put them together and see the ecosystem, because it is about an ecosystem. Uh, yes, it's just so important. So thank you so much. <laughs> January, please. Yeah, I think building on what Ibo said, and then also um, some of Neil's points, I'm probably a broken record here, but it seems like maybe what we, we as a community could do to um, to have a, an effective intervention would be showing the like the policy folks how their work is already um, maybe or could support already existing um, effective interventions in related areas. So what I'm what I'm trying to say is, if there's a way that we could go back to UNESCO counterparts and say, if you are willing to like invest in this and work on this, you can take credit for these other areas that are already underway and um, that have, you know, have significant impact in, in these different fields. So I'm looking at the open government partnership local options where local governments work with their citizens to outline the different commitments that they, they want to realize over the course of one to five years. And wouldn't it be great if we could we could show them, hey, these are your commitments to open education actually fuel your commitments to, you know, open fiscal reform or science or open data or or other areas that they're already working on. That would ideally incentivize policymakers and also give us kind of a an in for um, maybe some interventions to get some of the the hard work that or I think you called it the tough slog um underway rather than just kind of leaving it at the abstract level anyway i i think i've said that before in probably different more convoluted terms but i'll post the link in the chat thank you thank you very much i think we are coming to to the end of our meeting i don't know if neil would like to give some final words or anybody else um but it has been fantastic and uh, definitely let's Let's think of ways of taking this work forward. I think definitely it's uh, something we should so, be thinking about. I, I mean, I'll, I'll just repeat my gratitude for uh, you all taking the time to, to listen to uh, to me talking, which always surprises me. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I'm glad also to hear that, that what it does is, is to stimulate that process of, of posing questions that we need to find answers to. We, we certainly didn't think that we had found answers but we did want to, to really to to show uh, you know uh, shine a light on the, the fact that I think you know ever you said we all know that policies are important and I think that that truism is not true I, I think policies are actually most often quite destructive in terms of their impact um, because they set up commitments that are not attainable in practice uh, and they steer down pathways that, that I, I think have the opposite of the intended effect. Um, but, but I think I do think coming out of this, and I hope we can continue this discussion and I can share more ideas and 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 get some inputs from from this whole network, is I think there are also ways in which we need to be able to to be able to to have much more rapid responses to things. So, so just to, to Julia and your your point there, I don't think we can stop the political rollout. You know, when a politician has decided he wants to give his teacher union 200,000 laptops, good luck getting in the way of that. 
what we do need to be able to do is to turn around the content solution that gets driven with that fast enough to be able to run in, par in time with that. So when we're starting to look at the packaging of, of educational resources for, for um, students, for example, it's such a fragmented landscape, you know, math mathematics, science, you have to look all over the place to pull the content together. Then you're looking for platforms where you say, well, so every single instance that I'm working on, you have to have an offline synchronizable version of the content repositories for implementation to work successfully because the school's internet access is not sufficient to be connected online. And you know we're exploring various options, looking at Calibri, looking at what Moodle does, looking at all, all et cetera, et cetera. But the, the truth is that these are not black box installations by any stretch of the imagination. And that's what they have to be. You know, if I want to put an installation in 1500 computer laboratories, which I have to do in the next four months, I can't be putting something in place that's like a Raspberry Pi uh, Heath Robinson assembly affair that's going to break down every five minutes and require someone with technical skills of a PhD to work out how to assemble it. And because they did it once in one school in rural Zambia and they said it was a success, sorry, that's not true. Um, it's only successful if you can put it in 1500 schools and it works successfully and seamlessly for two years without requiring maintenance. That's the definition of that technological success. And our content repositories need that technological architecture. So I'm going to share lots more of those kinds of things as we go through our journey. And maybe this community can, we can start mobilizing resources to help to find some of these solutions so that, as you say, Julianne, we can join them rather than trying to tell them they're wrong but help them to make success out of what they're doing that was stupidly conceptualized in the beginning. And, and then everyone's a winner, which is what we're aiming for. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Thank you very Sorry. much. Very long. Thank no, summer. fantastic. Thank you very much. You, you know, just, just one thing that you said, I think policies are destructive. I think you said something like that. It, it really made me think, because from the experience we have, uh, at least in Europe, which is exactly the other side of the coin, because you're working on the developing world, you know, that you said, um, quite a lot of the policies that we had implemented had very good results, long-term results. So maybe this, this is something that we could look into more closely, you know, contextually based um, um, what it means to have policies. And in fact, one of the conversations in Europe is that we need more policies because normally policies in Europe come um, alongside uh, money for implementation for countries, so on and so forth, you know. So maybe these are nuances that we could look into uh, in terms of different contexts, right? So this is this is just a coin there, um, a cent that we say, no, my cent on this. But thank you again very much. We will distribute this um, this recording um, and uh, it's been fantastic. It's just the beginning of the conversation. So thanks, Neil, and thanks to, to everyone who joined. Just to say that our next meeting is on the 2nd of May, 2nd of May, and Nicole Saad from Wikimedia said she would join us to, to, to do a presentation. We, the topic is to be decided, but if you would like to do a present, to make a presentation as well, please feel free to sign up. Um, um, towards the end of our agenda, there is there a list in which you can put your names and pick your date, and that would be brilliant. So thank you very much, and uh, see you again next month, hopefully. All the best. Thank bye you bye so much. everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye everyone. Bye bye. Andrea. Bye.